argued with people in the past when they said, well, you know, it's illegal to do this or it's illegal to do that. I said, it's not illegal. And if there are no laws except in some states saying it's illegal, what's prohibiting it is are your contracts with MasterCard and Visa and the various banks. That was what was actually prohibiting you, and this was the biggie, the no surcharge rule. Every person, and that includes you, who takes a credit card in payment of a debt, in, or in payment of a purchase, in fact, has to pay a bid for company. It could be one and a half percent. I've heard of How many of us have not gone to a store, and you don't have to answer me, and we find to use an American Express? And they said, oh, no, we don't take American Express. We only take MasterCard and Visa. Why? Because the surcharge was cheaper for them. So they didn't want to pay American Express surcharge, which could be 10%, if they could pay Visa or MasterCard surcharge, which could be 4%. But no matter whether it was 1 2 or 10%, Nobody, no merchant, was allowed to pass this surcharge forward to the consumer, to the customer. We as customers like that, but the credit card company said, boy, it's busting out the puzzle. Small businesses in particular were starting to say, we're not going to credit cards anymore. We can no longer afford to do so. So that was the main issue, was this no surcharge rule. Well, after eight years of litigation, they finally reached a settlement. Believe it or not, the settlement was put on the table in November of 2012. But it took another year for all the kinks. The settlement agreement itself runs something like 156 pages long. And yes, I... broke the settlement into two classes. Class one is everyone that took credit cards, branded MasterCard and Visa, since 2004. The litigation started in 2005. They went back. Really? This is you. This is really you.
you working very carefully with your provider, with your credit card provider, as to exactly what you have to do. But I'm going to give you the basic rules. As I already said, numerous appeals have been objected. 12 million merchants comprise the plaintiff class. Numerous objections have been filed, but they only represent 0.05% of the entire plaintiff class. Really, since MasterCard and Visa has already changed their rules, the appeals are meaningless. We really don't care what's going to happen down the line, because I can pretty much promise you that even if the appeals are won and the court is determined that the settlement should not have been approved, MasterCard and Visa is not going backwards. They're going to keep their real rule changes in effect. So now, you, a merchant. Now, one question that often comes up, Wanda, does this really apply to me? Or does it only apply to consumer sales? When you read the definition of merchant in MasterCard, Visa, rules and regulations, in litigation, there's no distinction. There's no distinction as to a merchant that sells commercial and a merchant that sells consumer. We will find some of those distinctions when we look at some of the state laws, but not as far as this antitrust litigation is concerned. So you're now going to be able to pass through your surcharge either on a brand level surcharge, and this is the one that we recommend and is used more often. This means that no matter what MasterCard or Visa is used, you pass through the same surcharge. And you account for rebates or discounts at the point of sale. Or you may use the product level surcharging. Product level surcharge means, for example, Visa Classic versus MasterCard Standard versus Visa Signature versus World Card. You don't want to be bothered with that. Stick with the charging and it's one across the board. Now, if you really have nothing to do at night and you are an insomniac, you can read the, the Visa rules and regulations. No. I've not read every page. Um, I've read a lot of it, but not every page. But I will give you a summary of their surcharging. If you are interested in looking at it, and I know some of you, Harris, my dear friend, likes to get into the law, <laughs> be my guest. Here's your website. Go read the operating um, regulations. Their rules and regulations are only 236 pages. Don't ask me. I don't know. Um, but again, I will give you a summary of their surcharging rules. And for those of you interested, here is their uh, website for their rules and regulations. Here's the Visa surcharge. First and foremost, you're going to hear me say it more than once. The notification of your intent to surcharge is a must. You must now tell your customers that we intend to surcharge. Visa, we intend to pass through our surcharge. And Visa must know at least 30 days before you start to do this. And um, I don't think my click here will work, but on their website, under this summary, you can click on that click here button and it'll actually notify these. There are many considerations and requirements. Okay, I'm going to start surcharging and then do it however you want. They are not accepting that. They will give you their FAQs, frequently asked questions. They will provide to you on their website the exact notice about their changes. 
And this one I think is most important. They will give you a sample of what they want to have you use. And it's a good sample. I have looked at them and read them of a point of sale or point of entry. Let me explain the difference. Target, Nordstrom, Walmart, Kmart. They will now have a point of entry notification to their customers that when we walk in the door, we will see, we will now pass through our surcharge. By the way, Target and Walmart are two of those companies appealing. Um, I happened to be in Walmart about a month ago. There's no notification up on their point of entry. And I don't expect I will see any there because they have no intention of passing through their surcharge. One of the reasons Walmart and Target are in fact appealing the settlement is they say it's no, not fair to them. Target in particular in its objection says we are known as basically an economical store that people can come in and buy whether it's their pop can or their Halloween candy or their linens and, and um, towels. And if we have to pass through our surcharge, then people are going to say, why should I buy from you and pay the surcharge? I'll go someplace else that isn't passing through the surcharge. So they feel that the settlement is unfair to them. And they feel if they don't pass, if they pass it through, they'll lose customers. If they don't pass it through, they'll um, lose money because everybody else is getting a benefit. Some of the small stores that are objecting are the same way. We can't afford to pass through the surcharge. And now people will go to stores where there is no surcharge. Notice again the consumer focus. There's definitely this consumer focus. That's right. That's right. And, and one of the things they argued, uh, one of the things MasterCard and Visa argued was, well, then you can have people use debit cards. There is, it is illegal. You'll see it on a future slide. Federal law prohibits passing through any cost for use of a debit card. And they also said, so Target, use your own credit card. So we expected that we would see Target encouraging people to open up their credit card with a byline that says, get Target credit card. With Target credit card, there is no surcharge. If you use MasterCard or Visa, there will be a surcharge. So we expect that we may see that that's where they're going to be fighting this. There is, pursuant to your contract, they're trying to clear this. Remnants, no. <laughs> this is a good thing. Today's the first day of spring. They're putting it in effect a maximum surcharge. You can charge maybe as much as you're being charged. I believe the Visa maximum surcharge is 4%. I don't know what the maximum surcharge is on MasterCard. Now here's your MasterCard some, uh, surcharge summary. Again, advance notice. You must give them 30 day notice. And here they're telling you what they want on their notification. Who are you? How do we get in touch with you? How many of your locations are surcharging? And this does apply to you because you may all be sitting in a room here in New Jersey, and of course I'm talking to people in the room. You may be sitting here in New Jersey, but we know that you have locations all over the United States. So how many of your locations will be surcharging? What kind of surcharging, what kind of channel is it? Is it safe to say? Do you have stores that people come into? Is it e-commerce? Is it phone orders? And we know that in particular your industry, you've taken phone orders since the day of the flood. That's a lot of how you do business. Or is it actual mail orders? How are you going to surcharge? Will it be a brand or product surcharging? And you'll recall I recommend the brand is the easiest one to do. 
you really want to contact your own provider, whoever is running your MasterCard or Visa, and make sure that none of your notification is wrong. You don't want to be in a position in two months of having surcharge and then have MasterCard come to you and say you did it wrong and you have to pay back all the money you, you got. Again, brand level or product level, and uh, we've already pretty much said that the brand level is one that it goes across the board. The cap, again, they will impose a cap. Each is currently at 4%. MasterCard is probably about 4%. They seem to run pretty even with each other. But now here's the last piece. You must let your customers know. We've already talked about the point of entry. That's easy to understand. But how do you let your customers know? They are suggesting that one way or another, you must let your customers know that you're going to be surcharging. Probably the easiest way most of you commercial business people are going to be able to do this is on your website. On your website, that's going to say from March 1, from April 1, Church and Dwight or Prestige Brands will be passing through a surcharge for credit card usage. You have to give 30 days to your customers. If you do it online, do it on your first website page. I have had discussions with clients over the years where they say, oh, well, all of our terms and conditions are on our website. I can remember one instance in particular where I called the client or actually emailed the client. I said, you said your terms and conditions are on your website. I can't find them. If I can't find them, how is your customer going to find them? How can I go into a court and say, but the terms and conditions are right on the website? She says, oh, Wanda, you're, you're missing something. Call me. I'll walk you through it. I called her. I had it up on my screen. She had it up on her screen. I said, now tell me where your terms and conditions are. Well, well you see down on that left-hand corner, you click on that button that says blah, blah, blah. I said, that doesn't tell me that's the terms and conditions button. Oh, no, but you click on that. I said, okay. I clicked. Took me to another page. I don't see your terms and conditions. Oh, no, now click on the kind of business you are. In my case, I was a magazine distributor. So now when I go into magazine distributor, now on the third click, I found the terms and conditions. I said, never going to hold up in court. Change it. Same thing with this. Give your notification on the very first page. Well, it's Surcharge notification. Even if they have to click on it to get to it, put it on that first page. Surcharge notification. Or you can notify them at the time of the transaction. I don't like this. My feeling is notify them up front and be done with it. But they say, for example, what if you have customers that always pay you by check? They buy your goods. You sell on, we'll assume for a moment, net 30 days, 45 days or so they send a check. You get it about 50 days, but you always get it by check. Now you've got a customer, net 30 days, you wait till 50, don't see the money. You call your customer. You say, what happened? Oh, yeah, we had a little bit of a glitch. Can I give you a credit card? Now, this was not a credit card customer. They had no way necessarily of knowing or caring about a surcharge. So now at the time of the transaction, you now can tell them, and here's my typo. I was so mad. I was looking at these slides last night, and I said, offer a receive, but that's a real word. Bill check doesn't pick that up. That should be offer a receipt that will explain and show the surcharge and make sure that customer signs this receipt so that you have a receipt in hand that says 
You've now explained your surcharge. I understand. I want to pay by credit card. I accept the fact that I will be paying the surcharge. So that's very important because that will that's happening more and more. I see it more and more with even mid-sized businesses that they run into trouble. They ask you if they can use the credit card. You approve the credit card, but never had a credit card transaction with them in the past. You need to make sure they now know about your surcharge notification and make sure they sign a receipt that you explained it to them and they accept it. Consistency. You cannot say, oh, you are charged 4 percent, but oh, I'm only going to charge you 2. You've got to be consistent across the board for all customers. All transactions must be surcharged the same amount and manner. You cannot play favorites. There is not even a provision for distinguishing them between type of customer, small business, large business. What the rules say at the moment, we don't know if they'll change, but right now the rules say you must pass the same surcharge through for all of your customers. Now, you may make a decision that says, well, I allow this pass through 4%, but I know my small business customers are not going to be able to absorb that, so I'll just pass through 2% for everybody, and I'll leave the other 2%. That is fair. That is fine. But it must be con con uh, consistent across the board. I recommend that you always, up front, ask the customer how it intends to pay. You may think that's logical. Of course I want to know how they're going to pay. I can't tell you how many credit applications I have reviewed over 34 years of practice, and I can think on one credit application where it specifies how you're going to pay. It just says you're going to pay me. So now you want up front to know, are you going to pay me by wire, by check, by COD or by credit card. Practically speaking, you are probably going to go to something like, is it anticipated you will ever use a credit card to pay these invoices? And if so, then here is the surcharge notification. So you don't have to worry about, did they say credit card? Did they not say credit card? This is up front. If you ever anticipate you may use a credit card, or, or word it differently, in the event you choose to pay by credit card, you may want something such as, we don't like credit card transactions, but in the event of a future transaction to be paid by credit card, these are our surcharge notifications. So that is up front and no one can say to you, I didn't know I was going to get pay, uh, pay a surcharge if I used the credit card. And as I say, even if the customer says, oh no, I'm paying you by cash, don't worry about it. You'll have a check on the 30th day, you'll have wire. Give them the notification anyway that there will be a surcharge. So make sure this goes up front, which may mean again revamping some of your credit applications so that it's right in there up front. Um, so that there's no question, did you or did you not? No. All so, the requirement is. So the, 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 for the folks on the phone, the question was whether there's a distinction between an online and an offline transaction, if I'm understanding you correctly, Jim. Uh, no, Wanda, please. actually yep. a little bit different. I think, Jim, your question was online, they pay by credit card, but if it's a, a, another transaction, they're not necessarily paying by credit card. Correct. Right. So is there a difference there? No. Credit card means surcharge allowance to be passed through. You don't have to. But that means you have to online tell them they're going to have a surcharge for credit card transactions. But if they're also buying from you 
by telephone or by PO that comes in electronically or through the mail, they're going to pay for that through check or wire transfer, then you treat them the way you always treated them. You've been able to surcharge since January 27, 2013. Of course, Visa and MasterCard didn't have their rules fixed by then, so nobody really was doing it. Uh, you'll notice the heading on the screen is credit card processing fees now legal for the most part. And I'm going to spend time talking about that. Federal law prohibits surcharging on a debit card. That's clear. There are various states that have laws that prohibit surcharging. And we're going to take a look at those laws because when you are selling online, what state is ruling? Where your customer is or where you are? Now, for and it's very interesting because my next talk is going to be a sheetment, and the rules are different for a sheetment. But for the most part, on wine transactions, the merchant uh, transaction is deemed to take place where you are. But again, that begs the question. Online transactions for any one of you on the phone or in, in the room. Is your transaction generated here in New Jersey? Or is it generated from your company in Puerto Rico? Or in Texas? Or in Tennessee? Where is that credit card transaction really taking place? And you need to know where is your facility that is housing that credit card transaction? It is illegal to surcharge your customer with credit card processing fees, surcharges, in 11 states. And these 11 states, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Florida, Kansas, Maine, Massachusetts, New York, Oklahoma, and Texas. Utah, as a result of this antitrust settlement, passed the law in April of 2013. The law only has a bite until June of 2014. See, here we are in March. I don't know what Utah is going to do. But what Utah statute is, is it illegal to impose a surcharge on any credit transaction less than $10,000. But you may offer discount. This is meaningless to you. Because the discount is if using a credit card issued by the seller, none of you issue credit cards, or an entity affiliated with you, or bearing your service mark or trademark. For example, my husband has a Macy's Visa card. So it's bearing Macy's service mark or trademark. The statute for these states is virtually identical. No retailer, listen to that word, no retailer. Are you a retailer? Or are you commercial B2B business transaction? Different verbiage than using the word merchant. They specifically say no retailer may impose a surcharge will elect to use a credit card in lieu of payments by cash, check, electronic, or similar means. So let's take a look at some of these. Three of these states, Colorado, Kansas, and Maine, have specifically adopted the Uniform Consumer Credit Code, and this language is contained under their Consumer Credit Code. I argue, therefore, that in these three states, Colorado, Kansas, and Maine, it has no application to business-to-business -to -business transactions. You may pass through your surcharge. California statute specifically uses the word consumer. Great. Thank you. Massachusetts statute is included under the consumer credit cost disclosure. Oklahoma? Consumer Credit Code. Note, Oklahoma has not adopted the Uniform Consumer Credit Code, 
but they have their own version of a consumer credit code. And Texas, while it's not called the consumer credit code, within the statute, after the language saying no surcharge may be passed through, it goes on to say, and this prohibition is specifically enforced by the Texas Consumer Credit Commissioner. So in these states, it's consumer. Go ahead and pass through your surcharges. The remaining states are unclear as to whether it's consumer or commercial. These states, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Florida, Kansas, Maine, Massachusetts, Oklahoma, and Utah, offer the ability to pass through a discount. How many of us haven't driven into a, a gas station? Cash or credit pay, uh, charge, uh, price. So these states say you can offer a discount to induce them to use a means of payment other than a credit card as long as it is clear and conspicuous. Well, every one of us walks into a gas station and we see cash price, credit card price, it's pretty clear and conspicuous to us. New York and Texas do not have a discount exception. Now, in these states, I'm not going to read the list, it's on your material, they are considering laws to prohibit surcharges to be passed through to customers. Considering they're sitting in the Senate House, in the Senate, in the Assembly, nothing's happened with them yet but they're out there. The Missouri Code was amended in July 2013 to prohibit surcharging, but it only applies to state-issued credit cards. I don't know that for the group sitting in this room, anyone is going to be selling to somebody using a Mississippi state-issued credit card, but in Mississippi, it could be um, an ambulance driver who's got a state-issued credit card for the purpose of buying gasoline for the ambulance, etc. New York law has just been declared unconstitutional. In October of 2013, Judge Rakoff, in a case called Expression Care Design Barrett versus Eric Schneiderman, who is the New York State Attorney General. Expression Care Design said this law is unconstitutional. It violates our freedom of speech, and it violates our freedom of commerce. The statute says no seller may impose a surcharge who elects to use a credit card in lieu of other payments. Any seller who violates this is guilty of a misdemeanor, $500 in fine, imprisonment up to one year, or both. Nothing in the New York statute says you can pass through a discount. Judge Rakoff said surcharges are perceived negatively, while discounts are looked on as a bonus or a gain. It's all perception really the same four cents, isn't it? But it's all perception. Judge Rakoff noted, and I quote, in terms of their immediate economic consequences, surcharges and discounts are merely different labels for the same thing, a price difference between cash and credit. He said further, this virtually incomprehensible distinction between what a vendor can and cannot tell its customers offends the First Amendment and renders Section 518 unconstitutional. He also went on to say it was kind of like Alice falling through the rabbit hole. He says it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever that New York can offer a discount, but you can't offer, but you can't pass through a surcharge. His decision's under appeal. New York State is appealing it. However, the same law firm, and it's, and it's an, a small individual law uh, attorney who hooks up with somebody in that state, 
I think, if I recall correctly, he practices personally in, in Florida. But he got together with a law firm in New York for the expression pair to sign lawsuits. He has now partnered with other attorneys in California, in Florida, and in Texas. And on March 5th, these three lawsuits were filed, basically saying, hey, we've got Judge Rakoff saying New York's law is unconstitutional. Now let's attack Florida, California, and Texas, and let's find these statutes to be unconstitutional. Clearly, I have no idea where those lawsuits are going, since answers aren't even due yet on a May 5th lawsuit. Are there any questions on this before I move on? Um, the question is, uh, since there seems to be some uncertainty, is there a recommendation as to whether to pass through a surcharge or not, um, and wait and see type of thing? No, not in my opinion. In my opinion, um, other than these 11 states, other than these 11 states, and New York has been declared unconstitutional, so make it the 10 states, uh, you can now pass through the surcharges. So work with MasterCard, work with Visa, and start, if you wish, start passing through your surcharges. Now again, that's a business decision. You may decide it's not worth it. But if you wish, you now should, may and should start passing through your surcharges. Do we have any uh, questions from online that, that we should address at this point? Yeah, w one question that I, I do know is uh, uh, consistent across the board, Wanda, is American Express. Yes. So uh, we talked plenty about MasterCard Visa, and what about American Express, and what's their position on uh, surcharge? Okay, um, and interesting, that is one of the questions online. And I'm just going to move on so I can see the screen a little bit better. Does it only apply to MasterCard Visa? Uh, Actually, American Express also So for those on the phone, there was a question from one of the gentlemen here, and uh, we're going to request Wanda for some more information on the American Express. And I will send it, uh, I will most likely send it to um, uh, Anna, and then she'll pass it on to We have another question. We have another question here from one of the people on the uh, dial in on the panel. Okay, the question is where is the sale located? The For the people here today, it could be New Jersey, it could be New York, um, or you may not. Your online transactions may actually take place in Arkansas. So wherever you are actually taking that online transaction. Actually, the last topic we're going to touch upon, which I do hope we have enough time to get through, um, will be your, your online transaction. That's what the Marketplace Fairness Act is all about, and it goes into the streamlined sales and use tax. So uh, I'm trying to watch my watch, and we'll, we'll see how far uh, we can get. Um, a sheet bin, basically, it goes back to England. Uh, it basically means if you can't find a person, and you're sitting on some money of theirs, you have to give it to the state. Now, what's interesting is that a lot of these sheets of laws speak to insurance policies and um, 
death benefit, but for the, I'm focusing today only on the treatment as it applies to commercial transactions. It's been adopted by um, the majority of states. If they haven't adopted the Uniform Unclaimed Property Act, they have some form of their own Unclaimed Property Act. Minnesota has just introduced legislation only this year. So first I'm going to walk you through the UUPA, the Uniform Unclaimed Property Act. We are talking about abandoned property, unclaimed property. Don't look for the word sheet in the statute, it's virtually non-existent. It's abandoned property, it's unclaimed property. What led to this was three cases that went all the way up to the Supreme Court of the United States, where in these cases, Texas, Fort Jersey, Pennsylvania, Fort New York, Delaware, Fort New York, say, I get the money, I get the money. And the Supreme Court finally had to decide who does the money really go to. And they clarified it. They said unclaimed property goes to the state of the owner's last address. Who is the owner as far as you are concerned? Where is their business located? So if your customer is in California, that is the state to which you will achieve that money, not your state. The state of the last known address. If you can't find their last known address, it's been so long, and they disappear off the face of the earth, and you try to send them notification, then you may pay it to your state. But most of the time, it's going to go to your customer's state. And here, we're just clarifying what we're talking about. We're talking about physical property, but I don't see that applying to commercial businesses um, very often. You might have some equipment. Uh, you might have um, something that they deposited with you. But we're pretty much talking two things as far as commercial businesses are concerned. Money, credit balances. They overpaid you, and you're sitting with a credit balance. They had defective returns, and you issued a credit balance. They were entitled to a rebate, and you tried to issue it, and they don't take it. It's sitting there. So this is where I'm seeing commercial transactions involved. It is presumed abandoned. Money, and that would be your rebate, your dividends, your um, deposit that you didn't use, your refund, your discount, three years three years. That's generally, across the board, what you're going to look at is three years. If you've had no communication with your customer, with the owner of the property, for this period of time, you can deem it abandoned. You will find, however, that it's very important that you notify your customer and then you report. Description of the property, last known address, identifying numbers, taxpayer ID, social security number. When was the last time you had communication with them? When was this last address a good address? And any other information which might be required by the rules, but these are the general rules. Reports by November 1st of each year covering the 12 months ending June 30th of that year. This is the UUPA rule. Please note, it will differ for some states. I've noticed most of the states follow the UP, UUPA. Some states are different. You must send notice not more than 120 days, not less than 60 days, before this November 1st report. How do you send the notice? The UUPA does not require it. I recommend certified mail or registered mail. Make sure that you have something that comes back that says, I sent it to them and it's stuck. I've got the green card receipt. Or I sent it to them and it bounced back. So this is the best address I have for them. Um, here's the money. State, take it and go away. The notice has to tell them, hey, we've got a $10,000 rebate check that you haven't taken. Do you want it or not? 
um, that we believe this is the last known address we have for you. There's no bar in you going to get this money. Go get it anytime you want it. And it's got to be $50 or more. So some, um, some states use a $25 minimum. UUPA is a $50 or more. If you don't file the report, 12% interest per annum. Or crews from the date you should have reported and paid over the money to the state. That's a hefty interest rate in, in today's um, economy. And a civil penalty of $200 each day that you don't file your report on time, up to a maximum of $5,000, subject to periodic adjustment as a state discretion. It's also day doesn't happen. Yeah, I knew it, but you know, I thought if we didn't file a report, they wouldn't catch us. It's a thousand dollars a day. So, I know um, filing an abandoned property reports is a pain, but it's certainly worth it. It's a thousand dollars a day, maximum. $25,000 plus 25% of the value. Helpful, and you've got a heftier fine. Generally, you'll find that the definition of property doesn't states. So I think it's the first one you guys are going to want, want to know is New Jersey's abandoned property law. Because many of you have many customers in the state of New Jersey. So your Chapter 30B, Article 2, covers credit memos, specifically credit memos, cash, or other similar property. Allows you to report in the aggregate where each amount is less than $50. So you can file a report for $5,000 and list all your customers because each of them is less than $50. But it doesn't tell you you don't have to report under 50. It just tells you you can report in the aggregate. It could be $5. It could be $10. But you can report in the aggregate. The same date, November 1, for property presumed abandoned as of June 30th. And they want you to report online. This is the preferred reporting um, for property in New Jersey. They want electronic payment, but they'll take wire transfer or check. The presumption of abandonment goes the same thing, uh, the same three years, last known address, sums of 50 or more you must notify. So you've got a five, ten dollar, you report it to the state, you pay it over to the state, but you don't have to do notification. $50 or more, you must notify your customer not less than 120, uh, I'm sorry, not less than 60 days, nor more than 120 days. And they actually give you sample notices on their website that you can use for notification purposes. Basically, when you report, they want the same records as the UUPA, but here Jersey tells you you must keep your records for five years, and electronic media must be kept for an additional two years above the five years. And they say reports with more than 20 property records must be filed electronically. So you've got 21 customers, you've got to file that report electronically. And they say compliance audits will be performed 
periodically. They don't tell you when, they don't tell you when to expect them, but it will be periodic. Anything more, if you're sending New Jersey $50,000 or more, you may not send them a check. It must be e-check, ACH, or federal wire transfer. That's the only way they'll take that money, and it must accompany the report, which means, of course, you will be doing electronic reports in New Jersey. Penalties are $200 per day, up to $100,000. Interest is 10% per annum, and willful is $1,000 per day, up to $250,000, plus the same 25% that the UPA gives. So it's an important thing. Don't ignore it. So then I thought New York, because it's our neighbor from Jersey, would be of interest to you. They cover, um, basically, they specifically define bank deposit, security deposit, utility, and then they say, and miscellaneous. Anything else that we didn't specify is covered. They allow you to report in the aggregate of anything over $20 you can report in the aggregate. Uh, or anything rather under $20 you may report in the aggregate. So that, that's useful. Uh, the number, notice 20, Jersey was 50, you may report in the aggregate. Again, notification not less than 90 days, and they specify first class mail. You know what? I don't like that. Send it certified or registered. First class mail, you have no way of knowing if it got there or not. But New York only says first class mail. That's all they're requiring. But I, I don't trust them to not come back and say, well, how do you know they got it? So spend the extra whatever, $4. If there is property in excess of $1,000, now they want you to send a certified second notification, not less than 60 days, Say we notified you already. You didn't respond to us, so now we're sending you a certified letter. Um, I think if you send a certified letter in the first place, you don't need to send the second one. Oh. So your set off right can apply here, right? Yeah. So yeah, oh, definitely. If you have a customer say that if we take the discount that they're not allowed, they cash discount again, you allow that? Okay, the question is, right, the question is, what can I do about cash discounts that are taken but aren't allowed, or when I, or, or then you add it, and what if I owe the customer a credit balance? You owe the customer a credit balance, and you have not been in communication with this customer, it's no longer a customer, and it's three years, that money has to go to the state. It does not belong to you. You know, um, that's, a, that's a very good question, and it's a very common question, that so many of you say, well, well, what if I'm still doing business with the customer, and he's got a credit balance, but he doesn't apply it or he doesn't take it, what can I do then? And then I think it would be a prudent business decision to be in communication with your customer, not leave three years to go by, and say, hey, I've got this credit balance for you, and you haven't bought from us in the last six months. Therefore, I am mailing you a check for $100, for $10,000, whatever it might be. Would it not be easier and more practical for you to mail that check to your customer when you know they're alive and still in business instead of worrying about having to report it to the state? Now it's not deemed abandoned property because you've given it to the customer. But if the customer closes its doors and you've got that credit balance sitting, but if that customer does owe you money on something else, yes, by all means, offset whatever they owe you versus the credit balance you owe them. But at the end of the three years or five years, depending on the state, you have no communication from them, you're not even sure if they're in business anymore, then you achieve it to the state. Does that answer you? Yeah, and you're using three years, but can they technically go back beyond three years? Yeah. yeah. We're in the process now. We, we fired out like firms to pretty much protect us in the event that we do have a state company. They're asking for that. They go back, you know, back 
back in 1990. Yes. What I'm saying by the three years or five years, when is it deemed abandoned? But I can almost guarantee you, if you have been audited by a state because you did not properly report unclaimed property, well, they're going to go back from the time you were first in existence and say, how much money did you? And I have been told by other commercial trade credit grantors that they got hit from the time they, from the day they incorporated and ended up paying millions of dollars. Now, most of you don't have those records. Most of your accountants will tell you you keep records for seven years, and after seven years you don't have it. So the likelihood of them finding it then is going to be hard and difficult. What's also terrible is the state talk to each other. So if you get audited in Jersey, don't be surprised if Jersey doesn't contact New York. Say, hey, you know, while we were conducting their audit, we noticed they have a lot of customers in New York. Why don't you audit them as well? So it, it just is practical, good business to just do your reporting and hope they never decide you have a hiccup and go back to the date of existence. Yeah, there are outside consultants that work both for the auditors, but there are also a lot of outside consultants that work for you, um, the trade credit grantors. And I keep myself on a mailing on an email list for one of these um, outside consultants because they're they're the ones that are always popping up. Oh, watch Mississippi! You know what I noticed in January of this year? All a whole bunch of states revising their um, death benefits for us. You know, when is the death benefit deemed abandoned that you can't find the family? So, yeah, there are consultants out there. And yes, it could be very costly. And if you haven't been filing abandoned property reports, and it's time to start. Because you will, you will get them. Um, their report, their um, penalties are actually lower than the UUPA, $100 in interest at 10%. These are willful failure and, again, a penalty for a fraudulent return. Um, I included Minnesota only because the value that they look at for unclaimed property, as opposed to the UPA, which was $50, is under a, uh, more than $100. So if you've got some $100, $99, you don't have to report it in, in Minnesota. The same date as the UUPA. They want written notice not more than 120 days prior to filing the report. But their interest does match the UUPA, it's 12% if they find that you have not filed a report and they find you owe the money. But the interest only goes from the date of the written demand by the commissioner. So that's different than the UUPA. Guilty, $1,000, or willful guilt, shall be guilty of a gross misdemeanor of $3,000, imprisonment of not more than a year for both. Ohio, unlike the other statutes, they just call it on claims funds. And they look at five years. So better than the three years, so you don't have to worry about it, but theirs is five years. But they said, I pick states just for their differences. And they give you a distinct list of what they want in their report. And there, they don't care about reporting unless it's over $1,000 per owner, per customer. And they want a statement of what, how you try to keep the, the uh, owner and you maintain your documentation for five years. If it's under $50, then file in the aggregate. Same date as UUPA. But here, they want you to send notification of more than $50 a day, which is a little bit contradictory to the reporting of not more than $1,000. And here they say notice to be sent is under over $50 but less than $1,000. My certified mail return receipt requested is over $1,000. So they have some specifications. Here, $500 a day can be your fine in Ohio. So they're a little bit stricter. 
that was reflected with the two today. Pennsylvania, over $50, under 50 you report in the aggregate. This one's different. They want their reports April 15th. Notice almost everyone else November 1st. Pennsylvania wants their reports by April 15th. Their penalties are $1,000 a day up to a maximum of $10,000. Imprisonment of 24 months plus the fine or both. Texas goes to three years. And um, they say that you have to report and you have to say, according to my knowledge and my record, um, the holder didn't try to get this money at all. They didn't assert that they owned it. They didn't do anything to assert their ownership whatsoever. But description again. New regulation as of December 13th, all Texas reports must be rigged up electronic. No more paper filing. I expect we're going to see this more and more, more and more. And here, when you file your report, you must maintain your record for 10 years. Interesting in their statute, it prohibits any person, business, corporation from entering into a private agreement relating to achievement of unclaimed abandoned property. I'll tell you what that means in English. Don't go to somebody and say, hey, how about if you pretend to be XYZ company? And I'll say, I found you. And I sent you the $1,000 I owed you, and then you give me back. You know, you keep $100 and you give me back. Yeah, that's what that's all about. Not to enter into these private agreements that, hey, I found them. Um, 10 percent of the value is the penalty in Texas, and Illinois is pending. 45 days prior to reporting, you must send your notification. Not a law yet. I gave it to you because it's pending legislation. So watch for Illinois may be coming down um, in the near future. Missouri is pending. Now, interesting in Missouri, though, they have a business-to-business -business exemption. They say, because you asked about credit balances, and I bet most of you have unclaimed property that's credit balances, but you're still doing business with them. But they won't take this darn credit balance. And they pay you your invoices all the time, and you're sitting with this darn credit balance. The Missouri bill proposes that any outstanding check, draft, credit balance, customer's overpayment, or unidentified remittance issues, blah, 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 as part of a commercial transaction, shall not be presumed abandoned if you have an ongoing business relationship. That makes all the sense in the world. So it's like, good for you, Missouri. And they go on to define an ongoing business relationship means you are engaged in commercial, business, or professional transactions regarding goods or services within that dormancy period. So that, again, pending legislation. Hopefully, it will go into effect. Michigan only went into effect October 29th. And um, it's a, the state can examine your record whether or not you have complied. So Michigan said, hey, I want audit powers. That's what their statute is, audit powers. And they go on to tell you what the examination will entail. So Michigan has gotten quite tough. Now, um, I'm short on time, but that's all right. I was specifically told, focus on the first two topics faster on the last one. Let me tell you what the Marketplace Fairness Act is all about, um, and I'll slide through the slides quickly. It gives the federal government an opportunity to say, you know what, all this internet business transaction, all this e-commerce that never got taxed, now it's going to get taxed. So we are going to pass this, modern, this Marketplace Fairness Act in order to allow every single state to collect sales taxes on e-commerce, but only after they have revised their sales tax laws to be streamlined and simplified. Yeah, I tell states to make their laws. So 
there's going to be um, software available. There's going to be um, computation sources. You're going to be able to use a third-party service provider. How many of you already use third-party service providers for filing your e-commerce sales tax in the room? Obviously, I can't see who's not in the room. None of you do. Um, in, in the room, how many of you have any e-commerce at all? Only the oh, yeah, two. All right, half of you. We're, we're starting. Yeah, you're starting to get into e-commerce. So get ready. It's coming. It was passed by the Senate in May of 2013. It's not law. It's not law. They do describe, though, the remote sale, and it's specifically a sale into a state where the seller would not normally be required to pay tax. Now you have to. And the remote seller is you that sells into that state. And the states are all the states, and Puerto Rico, and Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, and America Samoa. They, um, these definitions I will skip through because, um, because I want to get specifically to the fact that the option one is to become a member state. 24 states have become member states in something called the Streamlined Sales and Use Tax Agreement. 24 states. There is an exemption for a small business. If that small business does less than a million dollars gross a year, they don't have to collect and pay the sales tax. What you're going to find with this Marketplace Fairness Act is it's stuck. It's stuck in the House Judiciary Committee. Chairman Goodlock has said, I am never bringing this to the floor for consideration. He has proposed his basic tenets of what he says should be internet sales tax law. Simplicity, competition, state rights, and privacy rights. One of the questions that um, one of your members emailed me was, Gee, you know, if we start getting into this e-commerce and we start getting into credit card transactions and we now have situations like happen to Target, what is our responsibility? Your privacy rights of your customers remain the same. You still have to safeguard your information. You still have to make sure that there is no breach of security. So these are, again, uh, the remainder of good luck tenants, and many organizations are opposing the Marketplace Fairness Act. What this will actually do is overturn the 1982 Supreme Court decision. In Quill versus North Dakota, what the United States Supreme Court said was, unless you have a nexus in the state, you don't have to pay sales tax to that state. So in other words, unless you have a location in that state. So now we look at Nexus. What does this mean? Well, clearly, if you have a, a distribution center, you're, for a moment, assume you're all in New Jersey, but you have a distribution center in Puerto Rico, in New York, in California. You have a Nexus in Puerto Rico, in New York, in California. Or if you have a, a distributor and they're located in that state, that's an affiliate Nexus. They are now, uh, Florida suggests um, their specific requirements for what is a nexus. But now they're talking about something called click-through nexus. And it says if a remote vendor is affiliated with you and they do e-commerce, then you are a click-through nexus and you have to start paying sales tax into that state. These states, Arkansas, Connecticut, et cetera, have some form of click-through nexus. Kansas is pending. West Virginia recently approved, but it hasn't been signed into, into law yet. And these are the oppositions to it. I'm going to, yeah, Jim uh, Wise, your lobbyist, by the way, um, is following it for me as of February. Doesn't look like it's going anywhere. However, what is in existence today is the Streamlined Sales and Use Tax Agreement. This was created in 1999, and as I said earlier, 24 states have passed conforming legislation. When I say 24 of the 44 states, I mean 24 of the 44 states that are, in fact, collecting sales tax, have signed the streamlined sales and use tax agreement, 
and I won't read the list to you. It's in your slide as to who they are. Non-member states, so the other 20 states, have their own version of what they consider to be streamlined sales and use tax. New York, of course, who never likes to adopt uniform anything. As an aside, the Uniform Commercial Code revised Article 9 again in 2010. New York hasn't even submitted legislation to adopt the changes to Article 9. So New York just likes to do things their own way. They have a Simplified Sales and Use the Tax Administration Act, specifically addressing out-of-state vendors who are selling into the state through, via um, either having a nexus or via e-commerce. And they specifically have the two conditions. You have an affiliate or you have a remote vendor. Amazon in New York challenged the New York State sales tax. They said it violates the equal protection clause uh, because it essentially targets us. We're the biggie. So it targets us. And it violates the Commerce Clause in the United States, which allows free enterprises. And it went um, all the way up to the Supreme Court. They applied for certiorari. What that means is you can sue at the state court. You can appeal it to the appellate division. You can appeal it to the New York State Court of Appeals. In the federal court, you start at the district court. You have an absolute right to go to the Circuit Court of Appeals. Nobody has an absolute right to go to the Supreme Court of the United States. You must petition for a writ of certiorari. And the Supreme Court first issues the decision on whether or not to grant you a writ of certiorari, which means whether or not to grant you the right to be heard by the Supreme Court of the United States. And the Supreme Court of the United States said, Amazon and Overstock, no. We don't want to hear it. We don't think it is it, it, important enough for the Supreme Court of the United States to be looking at this. So, too bad. What you'll find in the streamlined sales and use tax provisions are all the simplified tax returns, simplified administration, one level of administration. Now, it's very interesting. That, that's number one on their list. State level administration of sales and use tax collection. I did this, I did this program um, three weeks ago, and I was told by one woman there, she said, Wanda, in Louisiana, I have to file a separate tax return in each parish in Louisiana. They have absolutely no state level administration of sales tax returns. And she told me of one other state, I believe it was Oklahoma, that likewise has no state level. They insist on the filing separately in each tax jurisdiction. What some of the other people there was a book publishing group, so they bought of uh, e-commerce. And what they said was, oh yeah, we file one tax return with the state, and they distribute the sales tax to the counties and to the cities without us having to file separate uh, returns. Again, remote sellers are those that you're here, but you're selling over there and you're selling through e-commerce. This Quill versus North Dakota 1982 case is probably ineffective now that the United States Supreme Court has denied Amazon and Overstock's ability to appeal. Um, there are some amnesty provisions that's probably going to drop pretty soon. One ability to file one return, and then the state will disseminate the funds. Over 5 million online sellers are small as defined, less than 1 million in growth. Almost 60% of total U.S. retail commerce takes place among the largest almost 1,000 companies. And the average large online retailer collects sales tax in about 18 states, representing almost 50% of total national, state, and local sales tax collection. So where do we go from here? Basically, the, the Supreme Court of the United States has shot down over stock and Amazon. So therefore, New York State law stands. Nobody's challenged streamlined sales and use tax. 24 states have, a group, have adopted it. 20 other states have their own statements. 
and it seems that I don't care whether the Market Pay Fairness Act ever passes or not, internet taxation is here to stay. So those of you that are already into e-commerce, those of you that are going into e-commerce, it's here. It's here, and you will probably, um, some of the um, companies that I was with a few weeks ago, I'd say the majority of them told me they had providers, service providers that are doing their sales tax for them. A few of them said, no, we do it in line, in-house. In and one of them said, yeah, we do it in-house, and I'm the one that does it. <laughs> so it, it's here. Internet taxation is said, uh, certainly here. And according to my watch, it is exactly 1230, but I will take any questions if there are any here, or do you have any? No? Okay. So no questions? Hearing none, it's time to eat. For the folks on the phone, I uh, want to thank you for your time. I want to thank Wanda and want to thank the uh, Consumer Drug Allied Lines uh, group for uh, permitting us to broadcast this webinar. Uh, my request to all of you on the phone is, you know, absolutely reach out and expect the deck and the Q&A as a follow-up to this uh, conversation. And uh, as you sign off, there's a, there's a very short survey. If you could fill that out, you know, here at Courage B, we're going to try to make sure we get you good content, good speakers. Always looking for improvements, and I know Wanda's looking for feedback as well. So once again, thank you for your time, and uh, look forward to follow-ups. We're signing off now. Thank you.